it's Macca time again. I'm glad you enjoyed part one of the big interview with Stephen McManaman. Just first before we go on, a little bit of Christmas help for you, just out of love and affection. I've updated Barca, the making of the greatest team in the world. 40 extra pages talking about the way in which Pep Guardiola's golden era at the club came to an end. The move of Tito Villanova from assistant to boss. And the tragic loss, cancer took him away from football. A good man, um, much missed, gone far too young. In the update too, is analysis of that volatile, interesting season under Tata Martino. How clear he is about how badly he did. Fascinating to hear in football somebody accepting blame and, and self-criticising. Also, 2016 has been a bugger of a year. It took away from us my football idol of all time, Johan Cruyff, the godfather of the modern Barca. Some of my feelings are in there. Look, there's your Christmas present talked about. The book's available everywhere. Let's admit that. The reason we'd like you to buy directly from us, well, two reasons. It guarantees you'll receive the new edition. Buy from elsewhere, and it's possible you get the original. Secondly, Backpage and I make a little bit more money if you buy from us, which helps us keep writing, publishing, and producing these big interview podcasts. Go to grahamhunter.tv forward slash books to buy from us right now. The second part of this interview with Steve McManaman, recorded in Barcelona, came when Steve was in the city for the Manchester City Champions League game. Steve's got happy memories of the Camp Nou and Champions League nights. His deft, clever chip over Roberto Bonanno established a crucial two-goal lead in the semi-final Clásico during his time with Madrid, the season that led to his second Champions League medal. You're going to hear about ugly scenes outside the stadium for the Galacticos and the hero's welcome which awaited him in the dressing room following that win on enemy ground. But there was frustration too. Maka recalls the growing tensions between the players and the club's hierarchy, which culminated in a series of late-night team meetings to debate whether or not to celebrate the 2003 league title publicly. Astonishing scenes they were. He discusses the brilliance of Ronaldo, the Brazilian one, and how Zidane was not an instant hit as a player at Madrid. He also notes what that might be able to tell us about Paul Bogba at United. Plus there's Claude Makaleli, a footballer who was more important than Luis Figo and whose departure marked the end of that famous Madrid Galacticos era. Maka knew when it was time to move on and he knows how to tell his story. I think you'll agree with me. Enjoy it now. Gerard Pica was on television recently, he's a bit of a character, can play, a bit of a lad, certainly not showing a confidence, intelligence, and he said that in the Old Trafford dressing room, one, I knew this already, he played a lot of poker with Rooney and uh, Shea, Wes, Brown, and one or two others, and the poker schools helped him a lot, helped him integrate, helped him show exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying, decent lad, pays his stakes, learnt a bit of scatological English as well. That helped him. He said there was huge amount of pranks in the mansion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, huge. Came back, he brought some of that back to Barcelona. Yeah. Barcelona was scandalised. Yeah, yeah. Don't fucking touch my shoes. Yeah, don't we don't do my that. Shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck. They were absolutely scandalised. Yeah. What, what were the things that went on in Austria or on trips? Were there pranks? How did you earn your stripes? We know, I think, that Sanchez and Niero, for every reason, not just footballers, but in terms of what well, men they were, were leaders. Yeah. Bring us behind the scenes of that group. I found it quite normal, to be honest. We went out for a meal. I couldn't speak Spanish, sorry. You know, but I had to get up and sing a song. You know, stupid things like you that. Did you did know, that even like, then? Yeah, initiation. It was, it was very, very funny because Rob Jones, the ex-Liverpool player, fullback, teammate of mine at Liverpool, he was over-visiting and I said to him, we're going out tonight, do you want to come? So he went, yeah, I'll come. So we all had a meal out, you know, the whole team. And he's with me, you know, and people knew him because it was, I left to come to Real Madrid at 27, and he's 27. I think subsequently went to, he retired because his knee was bad, but I think he went to West Ham to try and try and get back on track. And anyway, he, he eventually retired, injured at 27. It shows you, people talk about sort of Bosman's and this, and oh, isn't it amazing? But take, I went one way and he retired. Take your chance while yeah, you can, and I was, because I was, it can go against you. I love him, he's, a, he's a, still a good friend he, of mine. He's a right good right, player He's a well. brilliant player, yeah. he's a brilliant player. But he retired at 27, and that's the pitfalls of football. And he came over, and we went out, and I got up and sang a song. And of course, the Spanish lads 
didn't have a clue what I was singing. I, could, I, 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 I forget what I sung. No, I probably sang a Beatles you song. Can't stand Honestly, up I don't. In front of so I sang like a song that. anyway, and then they said to Rob Jones, "Right now it's your turn." So he, <laughs> he got up and sung a song as well. And we very rarely went out for meals as, as teams like that. A lot of the time, you'd only do it, you know, before the season or whatever. He came over again whenever it was, and we had another meal, and he came out again with us. Funny enough, but yeah, it was just like that initiation, sing a song, but it wasn't too bad. Pranks. Like every dressing room, loud ones, quiet ones, you know, people who look in the mirror at themselves all the time, people who were, you know, quite scruffy. And the loud ones were like um, Ivan Alguera was crackers, he was funny. You know, Roberto Carlos, I presume. Roberto, yeah, the, well, the Brazilian lads enjoyed themselves, didn't they, all the time. So I, that whole atmosphere just, it was like going from Liverpool, apart from not learning the language, it was like going from Liverpool dressing room to a Spanish type dressing room. Is that similar? Room. Yeah, I thought so, yeah, I thought so it was. No huge egos. When I got there, I thought, oh, you know, they just won the Champions League. This might be this or this might be this. But I actually think, I don't want to say the bad apples in the group, but I think the egos in the group, I think, had just left the club. Nucci had just gone. Davor had just gone. Pedder had just gone. I didn't know them, and I know them now, and the, the great fellas, but there was always rumours about, oh, he likes this, and he likes mm -hmm. to go out there, and he's a bit of a character, and he's this. Clarence had just gone, who, who, who people spoke about, or Clarence does this. and Cla So... When I got there, I thought, you know what, this is quite cool, this your, dressing room. Your coach is John Tusha? Tosh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was coach, yeah. Oh, and you... again, weirdly enough, we go away on pre-season training and pre-season was like a Liverpool pre-season because Tosh is doing a lot of the Liverpool exercises that Ronnie Moran and Roy Evans, all the way back to Bill Shankly, Joe Fagan and Bob Paisley had done. I'm training and we're warming up like a Liverpool warm-up and I'm thinking to myself, I even know all these exercises, you know, I know, I know what routines they're going to be in. I mean, Tosh wasn't around for, a, I think he was around for three or four months, I think Less it was. Than Less than that, yeah. And then well, Vincente come in. What almost did for him was, was this famous Madrid derby. The last one that mm. Madrid lost, and at the Bernabeu as yeah, well, yeah. for, I don't know, until Mourinho lost the cup final in 2013. Yeah. Jimmy Floyd scored. Yeah, yeah. I was, I, was in, yeah I was injured, so I never played. But they went through a real sticky patch, when, and I was injured at the time. I think they lost a few games on the bounce, didn't they? I think they lost to, like, Zaragoza. They lost to Jimmy. I remember Jimmy scored. Because I wasn't playing. I started the season, was injured, and then people... You know, when, you know, like it is in football, weirdly enough, when you're not playing and teams are losing, people are like, you need to get back, you need to get back into the team. And that was a real strange first year, that was. Because we had to go to that silly tournament in Brazil, remember? My this is the year bad. that United duck out yes. the FA Cup and you all we go, go and there play. And we all come back and we're in like 15th place in the league and we've got like, we have to play like, you know, 10 games in about 20 days. It was just bonkers that year. You know, Vincente and because the players Because when, when Dabowski comes in, you can't have known anything about him because really maybe you saw him as a footballer when you were very, very young. But he was certainly, he was named as an interim coach. Mm. There's no concept yeah, yeah, yeah. when he took over that... This is a guy who's going to go on and win the Champions League. This is a guy who's going to go on and become a club legend and then fall out of Florentino and manage Spain and win trophies. That was a weird season because weird season, things yeah. were so troubled that John Toshak is sat. The boss comes in as a, as a caretaker. Yeah. And you win the Champions League. It with some struggle, struggles in battles with Bayern yeah. Munich. Struggles in the league, trying to play catch up and playing so many games, but really, really clicked in the Champions League at whatever stage it was. I don't even know what stage it was, but really clicked in the Champions League. Do you remember the, the Bayern? Because I think you played Bayern in the groups. We played Bayern, Bayern twice and got hammered by them both. Thrashed, eh? Hammered. And it was a real wake-up call. It was like, wow, these are good. These are good. We played them four times that, that yeah. year. We lost three times to them, and we knocked them out of the Champions League. And we lost three times to them convincingly. They had a great team. They had a great team. And we had our battles over the year later. They knocked us out. We had battles with them. But we'd done it the hard way. I think we beat, did we beat United in the quarter of our, I can't even remember. We, did we beat United, well, it, then Bayern? I, I, I told mean, you one of our favourite interviews here was with Kevin Bridges. And Kevin's favourite player is Redondo. Ah, oh, yeah. Could, could he play a bit? Brilliant. Tell us. Brilliant. Describe Elegant, them. strong, brave. Give us the ball. I'm going forward. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to start things off. Really, really sad that he left, you know, to, to be voted whatever European Champions League Player of the Year or whatever it was at, the, at that time. And then for him to leave Madrid and get injured and sort of his career just petered out, it was yeah. really, really sad. He was a great player. Was it his? But that was that year of, you know, Florentino coming in and, you know, he should, he should have still been there now, bloody playing football. He was a great player, he was. But my memory is that sometimes they would ask you to play in that position too. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, I played, yeah, I played in the middle of midfield in the end, yeah. I mean, in the final, it was me, Fernando and Raul in midfield with, with 
Mori and Tezen, Nicholas and Elker up front. When you think of it, that's just a mad formation. <laughs> mad formation. And I was right. like a defensive midfielder with Fernando Redondo, with Raul in, sort of in front but, of us. But this is, this is Cruyff's point about Socio de Todos. You, you've talked about what you thought you could offer to players in a better position there. If a good player is there, give them the ball. There's an appreciation now for Sergio Busquets. And what people say about him is, OK, maybe he's a little bit slow, which he is. But at the ball, he always knows two or three moves ahead Absolutely. where it should go. And Absolutely. It's, 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 it, even if you, you think never, you learn you're about never football, slow. You're, you're slow. In, yeah, you're slow in a 100-yard race, but you're never slow on the pitch. I watched Ronnie Whelan growing up. He's not the fastest when you think of it, but God, what a player he was. I played with arguably the best, Claude Makaleli. He's not quick over a 20-yard, 30-yard race. Of course you'd beat him in a race. But God bless us, he got in the way of the ball all the time. I'm passing it to somebody across midfield. Makaleli's intercepted it. Ronnie Wheel and Makaleli, they knew just by people's body shape, right, he's going to pass the ball there and I'm there. And they were brilliant at it. And Busquets is the same. He's, <laughs> he's a man you can go, you know what? I'm trusting him all day long. I can give him the ball. He won't lose it. He'll give me it back or he'll pass it to somebody who's better. He's no problem. Give him it, give him it, give him it. And he's the one you can just hang your hat on all the time. He's seven out of ten every single game. He's not going to score, but he's the one to rely on. And that's why people... In that great Madrid team, when Claude left, it was like, right, that is the beginning of the end, you know, that year. Because everybody said, everybody to a man, who's the most important player in your team? Him. Not Zizou, not Ronnie, not the ones who scored 40 goals a season. The most important player is him, that fella there, that little fella there. Because he was the little cog or screw that made the whole... The whole lot. ...watch tick in Absolutely. time all the time. Absolutely. Equilibrium, what, balance? Yeah. Are these the right words? Yeah, yeah. I often wonder if it's a sense of self-sacrifice. Yeah, Because I good players so. like that need Absolutely. to have a football brain and a vision, but you have to say, I'm going to do this for him or for the and team. And that role, I think, it was, has gone... Well, certainly Fontino Perath at the time didn't, I don't think, appreciated that role, but everybody on the pitch appreciated it. See, and people speak about that role now. Yeah. But I, I think back to like Ronnie Whelan and stuff, and I think he had Barnes, he had Rushy, he had this. But I bet you the team thought he was virtually the most important player. And I certainly did with, with Claude. We all speak about Zizou and, and somebody gets the World Player of the Year this year and Figo gets it next year and Ronnie gets it the year after. The good thing about those players you have just mentioned, there was no egos with them. They knew that Claude was the most important player. Zizou knew Claude was the most important player, and that's what I liked. You see what he's, he's done, because Zidane's come back, Florentino's still the president. Mm. Florentino still thinks the same way. Who can I sign to make my company make money in mm. Colombia? If there's a great Egyptian player or an Icelandic yeah, player. Yeah, we'll have him, yeah. But, but because Zizou is Zizou, he's been out to say, president, step back, Casemiro plays. I don't care how much you spent on Danilo, Carvajal's the better footballer. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. Casemiro's got no name, no marketing. He seems like a, I mean, he's a lovely bloke, but he speaks like a, a Brazilian farm boy. Mm -hmm. But he makes my team work, so he plays. Yeah, I'm having now, him, yeah. I love that. That's that's yeah. verging on what you're saying about they recognise McLeod was most important. Casemiro plays because that gives Hamas or Isco or Cruz yeah. time and space to make the clever passes, to make the front three score the mm -hmm. goals, and it's a system. And I think you're. Oh, absolutely. Casemiro went out and loaned, didn't he? Went there, Porto, went there, Porto, went Porto, Porto yeah. come yeah. back, it wasn't good enough. Talking about you there, is he a bit slow? Of course he's slow. He's not quicker than Isco, or he might be quicker than Isco. He's not as quick as Ronnie, or he's not as quick as Gareth. He doesn't need to be. As long as he's in the right place, at the right time, and he doesn't go over there, and he doesn't go over there. So when I know a ball goes over my head, I guarantee that Makaleli will be there. And I guarantee now that Casemiro will be there. And that's all you want him to be. When you had so much ability on the ball, your career rose on probably two things. Your character saying, I'll take responsibility at Liverpool because it is vital that somebody leads and shows and gets the fans with us and maybe brings along players who aren't quite as good. You had huge ability. I don't know if it was all practised, if it was inherent, natural. When you're asked to go into central midfield, whether it's organising or whether it's taking the ball and driving from central midfield, it's a big change. Yeah. Were you bothered that you're no longer in the showroom window? No, no, it never bothered me, actually, because I always knew there was more to it. There was more to it. Luis Figo was a better... At Liverpool, I was possibly the best dribbler around. At Liverpool, the team I played in, certainly when I left, you know, they gave it to me and I had to make things happen. Where I knew that I could give it to him, he can make things happen. You know, if he's in a better position, as I said before, I'll give it to him. If he's one-on-one -on -one and that left-back's not very good and he's skipped past them straight away, my only thought is that's their weakness, give it to him, because he'll skip past them again. So it was never, it was never a case of that. I, I never had that ego where it was like, right, football is all about finds and weaknesses in the opposition. And if the weakness was the left back, I'd give it to Luis. If it was the right back and Zizou skipped past them or whoever skipped past them or Roberto Carlos was 
two on one all the time. It was like, right, that's their weakness. We need to feed him the ball. If it was in the middle of the field, we'd, we'd do it. We'd drive through ourselves. But when I played at Liverpool, if I played right wing, for instance, and I thought, you know, whoever we played, if I ran at the left back and went past them, I'd think, right, that's it now. You know, someone would know, right, give him the ball. Give him the ball. And my team would give me the ball as, as often as I could. I'd stay isolated, I'd stay one-on-one, -on -one, and the, the shout would be, give him the ball. And that's exactly the same at Madrid. Where's their weakness? Their weakness is there today. Boom. And whoever was playing there, get at him. And we had players that more often than not would, would get at him and would take him on. Talking about taking people on, how good's your memory? I remember being at, um, I was just moving out here, renting a flat, and I happened to be covering the Champions League semi-final. They drew it as a classic. I think it was the first time the two of them had been drawn in Europe since... Something like 63 when Barcelona had knocked out the reigning champions room and had then gone on to lose themselves. You come to the camp now, it's Vincente del Bosque, Charlie Rexach on the bench for Barcelona. You win 2-0, two fabulous goals. It looked like a game plan where del Bosque said, oh, they're not that good. Yeah, we'll yeah, let yeah. them come on, we'll yeah, let them yeah. come in and then we'll sucker punch them yeah. because we're not looking for a nil. It looked to me as if you all knew probably you'd win, win. with that tactic. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember the goal, your goal? Yeah, I remember the goal. I, I don't remember, I mean, I remember it, of course, I've seen it can't remember what I was thinking at the time, but I'll never forget, funny enough, the celebrations afterwards, and I, I presume you needed to be Spanish and you, preferably you needed to be from Madrid because my teammates went mad in the dressing room after the game. I mean, it was a big moment because it was the semi-final and you've won away from home in the first leg, of course it is. But it was like they'd won the trophy. It was like they were, I think it was the first time we'd won there in a while, I'm not even sure. I always remember the celebrations because I was sort of mobbed in the dressing room <laughs> because, because of the second goal. And I'm like, yeah, great, yeah, we've won, you know, hopefully that'll see us, you know, we've got the second leg, but we should be all right, 2 nils a great league. So I'm thinking about getting to the final, again, getting to the final, getting to the final. But they were just as happy as I've ever seen them, the fact that they'd beat Barca there at the stadium. Because we'd had the, the years of Luis with the pig's head and the, having to come off at stages and you think, this is, this is just the weirdest place in the world, this. I'd never experienced violence like that going to <laughs> At that stage, it was proper hatred, wasn't oh, it? it was awful. I thought it was awful. Ugly. Smashing of the bus windows. I mean, it was disgusting, really. Yeah. And I thought to myself, if this happened in, in England, there'd be bloody... Six o'clock news, yeah, nine yeah. o'clock news, arrest. The parliament, the, how's the parliament be talking about it? But it was like normal. Police running alongside the bus with guns and stuff. I'm thinking to myself, what on earth? But, um, yeah, I'll never forget the celebrations after that because I remember them more vividly than ever winning a trophy. And it really? was one game, the Spanish lads' gutties, the Raouls, were, like, so happy that we'd beaten them. <laughs> I just thought, wow, this is like, you know, beating Man United or beating Everton, you know, for a scouser. It must have been like, oh, the enjoyments, you know, they were just ecstatic. It was a very, very elegant goal. And I thought it was really cold-blooded. You know, you, you, you break away, the, the, the team's tactics are coming true and the finish is gorgeous. I think it was a better goal even than he scored in Paris, which I think you've described as probably your happiest moment or your best moment. Yeah, or... just that. Well, scoring a final is scoring in a final. Well, scored the in the final. The camp now is, is yeah, yeah. gorgeous. Listen, mate, the main thing is that we won. I couldn't care less and about scoring. this lack of ego thing again. No, but yeah. I couldn't care less about scoring goals and losing games. It means nothing to me. I scored two at Wembley and we won the final, but we won the trophy. That's all that matters. Winning and scoring in the, in the final, it was my first year in Madrid. You know, it was sort of... People always questioned, why is he gone? Why has he left the Premier League? You know, and you sort of... Real Madrid were not on television every single week like they are now. So you sort of, you are gone, you've gone, you know, so people don't know what you're doing. They just have snippets now and again, all that, oh yeah, and, and next minute, you've won 3 0 in the, in the final, and everybody's like, ah, that's why, he's, <laughs> that's why he left. Because of course, it was really hard for me to leave Liverpool, and you know, people didn't like the fact that I left Liverpool and I left on a free. And, but it was jealousy or, of course, or well, I think so. anger? Well, I jealous, a bit of anger. I mean, I always found it fine within Liverpool, but, you know, people always tried to make a big deal of it back then. But then a year later, or even nine months later, people are like, ah, that's why he left. He's just won the Champions League. And it was my first year of ever playing in the Champions League and playing against the best players in the world. So to score, to win, I score and turn and run over to where my father is and all that. And, you know, nine months prior, he's just lost his son, as in me, to go to a foreign country. He's just lost his wife. So my dad's there were like 19 or 17, 18, 19 of my mates' family. So I ran over to them and sort of celebrated, and I saw them later on. You know, that's what, that's what it's all about. Quite, forget that. I mean, forget the goal. Forget the goal. Moment. And again, the goal against the, in, at Barcelona was great, but it was only great because we got to the final. If we won 2-0 then and lost 3-0 at home, I wouldn't be sitting here going, oh, yeah, I scored a great goal at Barcelona. I couldn't care less because 
But the main thing is, it was the building block to get us to the final, and then we won it. That was the, that was the talking point. But I wasn't. I'm not. Honestly, I'm not bothered about scoring goals and losing. Mate, it means nothing to me. Absolutely. Scoring goals and winning is the most. Or winning is the most important thing. And whoever scores is just part of the story. This is gigantic consistency to every answer you're given. So full respect, and I'm going to accept it all at face value, even though like. Every youngster listening to this, you'd be like, I'd love to score that goal. And yeah, it would, oh, definitely. It would matter to me as well. But well, me scoring and losing 3 1, do you think I'm going to walk off thinking, what a great goal? I walk off distraught. Let me put it like this I know players who would think that way. OK, yeah. Because some players Absolutely, yeah. live to score. Some yeah, possibly. players treat scoring like compulsive gamblers. Mm. It's in their blood, it's like taking caffeine or whatever it might be. It's like, live to score, live yeah. to score, live to score. The majority of them score to win but I think it's an addictive thing I think yeah. the glory I think that moment of jouissance where the ball's in the net I often ask people natural goal scorers what it's like and they, they find it hard to describe but I think if you take goal scoring away from them they feel a less person that's not you but I just think that your answers and your attitude probably help signify why you were a complete team player why you were continuously successful mm. I think yeah hopefully Enough hopefully praise. Zidane arrives Ronaldo arrives I'm not asking which is the better player but it must have felt like a bit of a privilege to watch. They were both really elegant footballers, yeah. I thought. And yeah. Zidane, a class above everybody else in his movement and his yeah. balance and his vision. But Ronaldo, I think, you talked about Rob's career being truncated. I, I don't think Ronaldo is properly appreciated in that I think he's possibly... Like nobody ever, when people are talking about Messi and yeah, Cristiano yeah, yeah. Yeah. and Pele I, and Maradona, yeah, I agree, nobody yeah. ever puts him in no, Ronaldo no. in the top four. Oh, no. and I remember in Monaco once asking uh, Eric Abidal, your best 11, and he, he says, Ronaldo, I said, Brazilian or He just looked at me as if I was like, As if, how dare you, yeah, yeah. Fuck, El phenomenal, idiot. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I always remember speaking to Albert Delares at the time, Albert. Under 21 coach for yes, Spain now. now yeah. yeah. And he played with Ronnie at Barca. At Barcelona, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before yeah. he came to Madrid. And he said, you know, at the time, he said he was just the most amazing thing he's ever seen in his life. And that, that summed it up for me. I mean, I, I think he's the most incredible footballer anyway. But he turns up at Madrid and, of course, the injuries he's had and the scars on his knees, you knew that he couldn't possibly be the same player as he was, you know, at Barca at mm -hmm. 19 and when he was with Bobby Robson and stuff. But he said, you know, at training, he said, you just could not get the ball off him. And that said it all for me. He didn't have to, he didn't have to say anything else. A player saying how amazing he was at Barcelona, you know, five, six, ten years prior, I thought, you know what, that sums it up, that. He must have been an incredible footballer because when he got to Madrid, and he was in, he was an incredible footballer. He was heavier then, and he was mm. living a, a little bit sort of loose. There, yep. there was night times, there was party, whatever. But he still seemed to one bring a lot of joy to his game. He's a very funny guy, I thought. Great guy, yeah. Always had a smile on his face. The Brazilians always were like that. You know, they always came into the dressing room and lit the dressing room up. Roberto, Fabio, Conceição, you know, Ronnie. They were always laughing and smiling and joking. And you thought, you know, great teammates because you need that at times. For a passer like you, what was Ronaldo's movement like? Brilliant. Can you try and describe what you saw when he moved? He was just like proper centre forwards are, like Robbie Fowler was. It was just all natural. It was just all instinct, you know. And good players knew whether he was coming and he, whether he was going to flip around the side. You know, you knew what he was going to do. He always played on that line of I could be offside if you not don't give it quick enough, but I'm going to be right on that line where I'm going to be quicker than that defender. People don't score that many goals if they're not, you know, just naturally quick in the mind, are did, they? You know? Did you know where to put the ball in? Or did you have to lot, show? Or did you, was there work involved? Yeah, a lot of the time, you know, you get it wrong. But a lot of the time, if you if you made that run four or five times, you might be offside. But if you kept on going, that's the good thing with centre forwards. They'll make that run ten times, good centre forwards, and they'll be offside nine. But the one time that he's on, it's in the back of the net, and that's what you just have to keep on feeding them all the time and hope and hope and hope that he got the run right this time, and they, and they do. He had a really hard time, Zizou, initially, didn't he? A Jeez, really hard the time. The few months, there was yeah. even... It's not funny, brewing, it reminds was... me a bit now of, um, of Pogba at Man United. We, you sort of bring him in, and it's like, God, where do we put him? Because yeah. I remember Zizou playing in about four or five different places. We were sticking him in every position, trying to make him play well, and it wasn't happening. He was struggling at left side of midfield, or he was struggling for the number 10 role, because we had a very fluid team anyway, you see, and he was getting in the way at times, and it was like, wow. You know, when's he going to... He showed us in training he was elegant and he could play, but it was like, you know, when's he going to do it? And it was like that final happens. And it was like, ah, you know, <laughs> that's what he does. That, and then from then on, I mean, it probably it was probably prior to that, but that final, it was like, ah, this is why he's the greatest player ever. And then he really, really flourished then. But I always remember, even for the greatest players 
And it reminds me of Paul Pogba now. He's played at centre midfield, or he can't play there. We need him in a three, or we can't play there. He was number 10 the other day behind Zlatan, or he can't play there. And he'll get it, he'll click soon enough. But sure. it, it reminds me a bit of that. Yep. It reminds me a bit of that. Where's we, where are we going to put him? And then Zizou just arrived, and then we thought, all right. And again, he was an immense player. I think I know the answer to this. Are you a little bit surprised that Zidane has taken over at Real Madrid, given the fact that he didn't used to flourish in public? He, he's, he's an intelligent, articulate man, but he's, he, you said timid. He's at least that. He certainly didn't like dealing with the media as a no. player. He's taken into it like a duck to water. I'm not particularly surprised he's a good leader, but being involved with managing a group of players, again, I would have not thought that was his number one priority in life. Mm. He's taken his time, he's done his badges, he's done a, a general manager's course, he's been an ambassador, he's been a youth team coach, he's been an assistant coach. Now he's at the top. And I have to say, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i enjoying it like nothing. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, I admire how he's galvanised the team. Mm. But he wouldn't have stood out to when you knew him as a natural manager, no, coach, no, or am I wrong? No, I, I think it takes all sorts, isn't it, to be a good manager. You need a lot, a lot of luck. You need a lot of luck to win games. But I think that Zizou's gone in and he's not abrasive, he's not a shouter, he doesn't want confrontation with his players. I think he just goes in and he helps this group of egos and he just massages them all and keeps them all happy. And he knows, it was a bit like Vincente when he took over us. He knew that he didn't have to do a lot because he had great players in front of him. He just had to make, you know, keep them all happy. Mm -hmm. I think if you go in and you shout and you moan and you tell people off, a lot of them, you know, they will just go, oh, I've had enough of him. We had it when Vincente went and Florentino had a, a raft of managers who came through the door and left through the door very, very quickly. And unfortunately, a lot of the players, they are the powerful ones. And I think if you go in and you keep them happy, Generally, if you know that your 11 is better than their 11, you'll win. you'll win. And that's what happens. So I think Zizou's perfect, probably, for Real Madrid. I think Carlo Ancelotti was perfect for Real Madrid. I don't think Jose was. I think he's that character. There's a lot of, you know, banging heads together. I think you just need to go in and be nice and calm. And I think Zizou exudes that. And I hope Madrid keep that. You know, I hope Santi Solari is a future manager. I hope Gutti's yeah. a future manager. I yeah. think this Good. role of these super managers who come and go and blur and blur and blur, I just think it's bonkers. Ah. I think this succession of managers, the Real Madrid way, I think in the future that could be absolutely perfect for them. Examples. Whether the president is, is, is sees it that way. Examples being boot room at Anfield. Yeah. Examples yeah. being yeah. Pep, Luis Enrique, yes. Tito Villanova. Absolutely. All title winning managers at Barcelona having come through the ranks and been youth products, two of them. We're going to end with a couple of questions. The, the first one I want to do is, you talked about the players being the powerful ones. I remember you told me a story about having Yaro and Raul deciding that you, you weren't going to do a lap of one after winning the title. There was a fallout with the club, a fallout with the local council. Mm. I think people will find it extraordinary to know that you as a group kind of defied Florentino because you yes. weren't allowed to go. What, what was the story? You win the title. We win the title. Uh, you know what? I still don't really know what it is now, but it certainly had something to do with the council and going round and not going to the Bellas and not going to uh, a lap of honour. And it was just a lot, you know, really spoiled what should have been a really good evening. You know, we were having meetings at four in the morning in the restaurants about after winning the league, are we going to go round the... The Bellas is the, is the beautiful fountain yeah. statue so, so I actually, in the middle of Madrid where yeah. the Madrid fans celebrate, right? Celebrate, yeah, which is quite organised now when they celebrate. Again, I think we were the catalyst a lot. Our group of players that changed, not changed Madrid forever, but changed a lot of what goes on now. But I still probably to this day, this story is probably wrong, but we were still having meetings about all our captains were about whether we were going to go round. And I've got friends there. Robbie Farlow was there. I've got friends and I want to go and celebrate. We just won the league. But three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, we're still having having meetings about oh, are we going to do this? And I remember going to a, like a, a nightclub afterwards with my wife and my friends and having a drink and stuff. And I think it was like seven o'clock in the morning. Somebody said to me, "We are going round the city now." And I'm like, "What?" I think Raúl came in. We are going to go round the city now. And I'm like, "Oh, okay then." But that was just you know, as I said, that was the beginning of the end. Really, Fernando had been promised a new contract and suddenly he was out. Treated abominably, yeah. in my yeah, view. Yeah, yeah, I, agree, I agree. The next you. day, Vincente was, was out for, again, an obscure reason. And I just thought to myself, you know what? This is not the place to be. And then, of course, Carlos Quiroz come in further down the line. Man United number two was managing Real Madrid. No disrespect to him, but, you know, we were the best team in the world. You could just see what was happening. It was like... A change of priority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much so. It wasn't about win, win, win. No. And suddenly it was about it was marketing, about marketing, marketing, marketing. And, and if also, you win as well. Yeah, it was like, you know, Vincente Del Bosco's just won the Champions League. 
twice, has just won the league. You know, we won other cups, and you can't just get rid of them a day after winning the league. What? What's the excuse? What was the excuse? The excuse was, I don't know. The players were too powerful. I think it was was at the time. We'd like a more modern coaching book. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. he went on and did quite well for the next well, ten fucking years. Hello. Florentino. And hello. Madrid, Madrid went through their, you know, they five went, managers and Florentino had five minutes. Resign, mm. saying I've spoiled the players. They didn't win trophies between two thousand and three and two thousand and nine, or whatever it might be. It was a bad move. We're, we're finishing on two. The first is, if I asked an English fan and I asked a Spanish fan to describe what kind of footballer you are, you were, what would they say? Would they say different things? I don't know. Possibly. Possibly. I changed a lot when I joined Madrid as a, as a player. I think at Liverpool, I was someone who ran with the ball, who dribbled a lot. It was probably playing with better players. You probably do change as a player, but you have to, you have to fit, in, it fit into, into the surroundings and you have to do what it takes to, to win games. So I probably was a different player in, in Spain than I was in, for Liverpool. You, you, f you finished at City. What do you think we can legitimately expect from Pep Guardiola over, say, a three-year period? Why do you conceive he's been hired above and beyond the fact that the likelihood, as you say, if you put a good 11 against a mm. less good 11, normally they'll win. Yep. Normally Pep will win your trophies. Yes. That aside, what, what do you conceive of with that structure with the Gerstein for and Siriano and Arteta and a real network for him plus money? Do you think he'll just change City? Do you think he's overrated? Do you think that you can embed a philosophy, one man changing things, like maybe Shankly there at Liverpool? What, what's your concept? I hope and I, I think he, he will deliver better football, a better type of football. He's not overrated because his, his record speaks for itself. But to manage Barca and then move on to Bayern, I expect Carlo Ancelotti to win the, you know, to not have a huge impact at Bayern Munich. I expect him to go, you know what, lads, if it ain't broke, go and win me the league, no problem at all, and they'll win the Bundesliga this year. So, you know, he's, he got really good jobs, hasn't he? This Manchester City job is a wonderful job for him. Arguably got the best squad in England before he turns up. They should have won the league last year. He's turned up and spent 190 million quid. I expect him to win the league this year, but I think he will play better football. I think he improved Bayern Munich. I think he was very unfortunate with People just think, ah, oh, he never won the he never won the Champions League. But he was unlucky against Atletico Madrid. If if, if Müller scores that second goal and they the go penalty. two 0 up, yeah. that's the end of the game. You know, the year before when Barca trounced them, the injuries they had was just incredible. And I went over to see them a few times as a fan. Went over to see Xabi Alonso and watch them. And I think they were great to watch. I just think they were very, he was very unfortunate at Bayern, even though he was very successful. But I loved the way he played at Bayern. I think he improved Bayern as a team. He never brought them the treble, but he improved them as a team. And I hope. He, he improves Manchester City as a, as a as to watch. They need to be more entertaining, Manchester City. If they're our standout English team, they need to play better football. With a spillover effect, ripples in the pond to teams, clubs around the Premier League, which, with due respect to those who've paid however many billions, Premier League's not terrifically high quality football. No, 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 of course it's not. No. I think it's fair no, to say. Not. That's why, I love, that's why I love watching Wenger's, Wenger's teams, because Arsenal always try and play the right way. I always want Liverpool to play the right way. I think... Manchester United under Louis van Gaal, you know, with Jose, they need to play the right type of football. Do you mean with more flair? Yes, definitely. Manchester United, Liverpool, Real, Barca need, for football's sake and the history that we've got, need to play entertaining football and always should play entertaining football. There's a, there's a higher power and that comes with history, that comes with success and having a past, you need to be the standard bearers and I hope Pep takes Manchester City to that level, I hope he, I hope he does. Well, I finished on a compliment in the first interview I ever did one-on-one -on -one with Pep. I tried to make a comparison with the brand of football he likes and Alex Ferguson, Manchester United, it was before Rome. I was in his office, sit down, and he kind of went, maybe like you've done, yeah. It's about winning. So I play this way, we play entertainingly because it wins us games. Mm. Simply, Simply yeah. because it, not to make people happier. I love it. He said, I've got friends who are unemployed. I love it if they come and they go away happy. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's, that's it's about it. winning. Yeah, well, it is about winning. Of course it is. But it's about winning and winning the right way. I'd rather win 4-3 than 1-0 and think to yourself, wow, what a game you've just witnessed then. For the first time in this uh, podcast, which is now ending, I wish it was visual so that I could say, look, here's the sheet where I sign up to the Steve McManaman doctrine of football because, <laughs> baby, you've got it and you talk it right to yeah. you. Thanks, dude. Cheers, mate. Gracias. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket. 
who's always been there for us. Big hug to you, baby. You can keep up with everything that we do, within reason. You can enter exclusive competitions and put your questions to our future big interview guests by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. How many times do I have to tell you? Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back, sign up. That grahamhunter.tv site is also where you can buy the new updated version of my book, Barca, The Making of the Greatest Team in the World. It's my account of the Guardiola era at the camp now, from 2008 until 2012, plus Tito, Tata and Adios Johan Cruyff. It is in all good bookshops now, but it does also make a big difference to all of us who've worked on the project. If you choose to buy direct, particularly for Christmas, at grahamhunter.tv forward slash books. You'll be sure to get the new edition and you will be helping us to continue producing independent content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.